Brilliant.org is a great way to interactively learn computer science and math. Brilliant has thousands of lessons that are constantly growing in both breadth and depth from the history of mathematics to artificial intelligence, programming, neural networks, and more. The computer science courses are quite useful in helping you nail down those fundamentals in an interactive and concise way. Brilliant is an excellent tool for lifelong learning and maintaining your skills in today's professional landscape. To try everything Brilliant has to offer free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash faculty of con or click on the link in the description below. The first 200 people who sign up will receive 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Greetings students and welcome back to another video on tensors. In this lesson, we're going to discuss the quotient theorem or quotient law for tensors. In addition, we'll also discuss the Levi Civita symbol, which will come in handy when studying tensors. Suppose I had a tensor S of contravariant rank P, so P indices in the superscript, and covariant rank Q, so Q indices in the subscript. Suppose that this tensor S was created from the inner product of some entity T and some vector V with a single contravariant index K. This equation, by the way, is invariant. It doesn't change if you transform the coordinate system. If these statements were true, then the quotient theorem states that the array T is also a tensor with a contravariant rank of P and a covariant rank of Q plus one. I'm gonna prove this theorem in this video. A lot of these proofs use the transformation law at some point. So let me begin with the assumption that there is a coordinate transformation relating two coordinate systems, the default coordinates x super i and the post-transformation coordinates x super i bar. This coordinate transformation is described using these n equations. I've only written one equation here, but keep in mind that i is actually a running index from one to n. We'll begin this proof by noting that since the equation is invariant, writing everything down in terms of the barred or transformed coordinate system should not change the equation. It's now become tradition in my tensor videos to use barred variables to denote the values of the variables post-transformation, so the barred equation, the equation post-transformation, and the unbarred equation are equivalent. Let's now carry on with the barred equation, which I'll label equation one. We can now write out the transformation laws converting from the unbarred coordinate system to the barred coordinate system for S, which is going to be this long equation with a whole bunch of partial derivatives in it. If we now use the unbarred equation to write out the expression for the unbarred components of S, as in substitute basically the T times V for the unbarred version of S on the right hand side, we will end up with the following. Let's now write the vector components back in terms of barred coordinates by converting them from the unbarred coordinate system back to the barred system. So in this case, I will write the unbarred components of V in terms of the barred components of V with this transformation equation. And once I substitute that, I'll get an equation which I'll call equation two. Next, what I'll do is I'll subtract equations two and one. The S part of the equations is the same, so that side of the equation becomes zero. Meanwhile, this is what we end up with on the right-hand side. Now here, what we can do is take the V bar component common and end up with the following. And since V is an arbitrary vector, the only way to guarantee that this equation is zero is to have the term in the parentheses equal zero. And if the term in the parentheses equals zero, then the barred component of T is related to the unbarred component of T by this following equation. And if you recall the definition of tensor transformation laws, this equation just represents the transformation law for a tensor of contravariant rank P and a covariant rank Q plus one. So therefore we can conclude that T is a tensor of rank P comma Q plus one because it follows the corresponding transformation law, and this therefore completes the proof of the quotient law. The next part of this video is going to focus on the Levi Civita symbol, which is denoted by this epsilon sub ijk. This is also called the permutation symbol. And before I discuss this Levi Civita symbol, I wanna go on the side and talk about even and odd permutations because that's crucial to understanding the definition of this symbol. Suppose I have a finite set of elements x, for instance, let's say x contains the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Now, when written as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this permutation, this arrangement of numbers is obviously in the proper order. 
one is less than two, two is less than three, which is less than four, and so on. And when it's written in this proper order, there are no inversions between the elements. None of the elements are listed such that they're out of order or anything. Everything is in the proper order. But what if I arrange it as three, one, two, four, five? Well, in that case, the numbers three and one aren't in the proper order, since three is supposed to be greater than one, but it comes before one instead. This is what you would call an inversion, when two numbers in an arrangement or permutation are out of order, such that the number that comes after is actually supposed to come before. So that's one inversion between the three and the one. Now, in addition, the numbers three and two aren't in the proper order, since three is supposed to come after two, so that's another inversion. Inversions can also be between elements of a permutation that don't immediately follow each other. So here, the two doesn't immediately follow the three. It's two spaces after the three, but it still counts as an inversion because it's not in the proper order. Three is coming before two as opposed to afterwards. So in the end, there are two inversions with this permutation. And since there are an even number of inversions, the permutation is called an even permutation. Quick note though that zero counts as an even number, so zero inversions like with one, two, three, four, five is still an even permutation. What if I have an arrangement or permutation given by four, one, two, three, five? In that case, I now have three inversions, four and one, four and two, four and three. And since three is an odd number, we say that this is an odd permutation. So in conclusion, an even permutation is one in which there is an even number of inversions, and an odd permutation is one in which there is an odd number of inversions. Let's use these ideas to now define the Levi Savita symbol. I'm gonna define the three-dimensional symbol here. There's also a two-dimensional symbol that's used less commonly, and of course you can go up to higher dimensional symbols as well. So the Levi Savita symbol is denoted by epsilon ijk and is defined according to the permutation of its indices, so how the indices are arranged. If the ijk are written as an even permutation of one, two, and three, then the Levi Savita symbol is positive one. If the ijk are written as an odd permutation of one, two, and three, then the Levi Savita symbol is a negative one. And finally, if any of the i, j, or k are repeated, so something like one, two, one, for instance, then the Levi Savita symbol is zero. You might find it a bit inconvenient to determine which arrangement of one, two, three is an even permutation or an odd one. So here's a diagram you can use to help yourself out. I'm gonna draw the numbers one, two, and three in this triangle. If my i, j, k on the Levi Savita symbol are arranged in a clockwise manner on this triangle, then it's an even permutation. If they're arranged in a counterclockwise manner, then it's an odd permutation. So for instance, if I have epsilon three, one, two, then since three, one, two occurs in a clockwise order on this diagram, I have to go clockwise to go from three to one to two. Epsilon three, one, two corresponds to an even permutation and is therefore equal to one. The same logic applies to epsilon 1, 2, 3, and 2, 3, 1. However, if I have epsilon 1, 3, 2, then since 1, 3, 2 occurs in a counterclockwise order on this diagram, epsilon 1, 3, 2 corresponds to an odd permutation and is therefore equal to negative 1. The same logic applies to epsilon 3, 2, 1, and 2, 1, 3. An important application of the Levi Savita symbol is in finding the determinants of 3 by 3 matrices and the cross products of vectors. So if I have a three by three matrix A whose elements are denoted by A sub i j, then I can write the determinant of this matrix A as the determinant of A times epsilon sub LMN equals A sub LI times A sub MJ times A sub NK times epsilon IJK. Now the L, M, and N occur only once in each term, so these are free indices, they are not summed over. We set them beforehand. I, J, and K, however, occur twice on the right-hand side, so they're dummy indices, and in fact, we sum over the I, J, and K from one to three. So let's do an example involving a determinant calculation. Suppose I have a three by three matrix A given by the following. According to this formula up here, we can find the determinant of A using the following equation. Remember that the indices L, M, and N are numbers that we set ourselves, while the I, J, and K are summed over from one to three. So just to make things simple, let's set the L, M, and N to be one, two, and three respectively. If we do that, then we'll have epsilon one, two, three on the left-hand side, multiplying the determinant of A, and then the following on the right-hand side. But epsilon one, two, three is just one by the definition of the Levi Savita symbol, so this is what we're left with. 
Now let's evaluate the right hand side by summing over from 1 to 3 starting with the index i. Next we'll sum the j in each of these expressions from 1 to 3. However, recall that whenever the indices are repeated in the Levi Civita symbol, the symbol actually becomes zero according to its definition. So we can cancel any of the epsilons we have here where the indices are repeated. So that will greatly simplify this expression. The last thing to do is sum the k in each of these expressions from one to three. And if we do that, we end up with this monstrosity. Now fortunately, we can use the fact that the Levi Civita symbol is zero for repeated indices to trim down this expression to something that's a bit more manageable. Now let's plug in all the values from the definition of the Levi Civita symbol and from our matrix. When we do that, this is what we get. And performing all the necessary multiplications gives us 8 plus 0 minus 3 plus 0 plus 18 plus 12, which means that the determinant of A is 35. You can verify this on Wolfram Alpha if you don't believe me. Anyway, that's one somewhat cumbersome application of the Levi Civita symbol. A quick note is that we can actually extend this determinant formula with the Levi Civita symbol to the n by n matrix where n is any natural number. The caveat to extending the Levi Civita symbol to calculate n by n matrix determinants is that we have to use a higher order version of that symbol. We can't just use the third order epsilon ijk that we've been using for 3 by 3 matrices. But the nice thing is that this higher order symbol follows pretty much the same logic as the epsilon ijk. If the subscript constitutes an odd permutation of the numbers i1 through in, then the symbol equals negative 1. If it's an even permutation, then the symbol equals positive 1. And if any of the indices are repeated, the symbol equals 0. Another note I'll make is that it's also possible to write the Levi Civita symbol with contravariant indices, where the indices are up top rather than at the bottom. However, I should note that the Levi Civita symbol is not a tensor. It's something called a pseudo tensor. A pseudo tensor is similar to a tensor that we defined in earlier videos but follows slightly different transformation rules. Another name that people sometimes use for a pseudo tensor is a tensor density, so you might encounter that in your readings. This concept is important when looking at the cross product of two vectors. If I have two vectors a and b and their cross product yields c, then I can relate the components of a, b, and c via this equation where epsilon, once again, is our Levi Civita symbol, and the indices i, j, and k run from 1 to 3. Since our epsilon is actually a pseudo tensor, this means that the cross product of two vectors a and b doesn't technically give me a vector, it gives me a pseudo vector. Similarly, the curl of a vector field is not a vector, it's a pseudo vector. Why is that? Because recall from vector calculus that the curl of a vector field V is defined as the cross product of the gradient operator del over here with the vector V. So because it's a cross product, we can then conclude that it must also be a pseudo vector. And this is why the curl is a pseudo vector. I won't discuss pseudo vectors and pseudo tensors much further in this video because they don't really add much to our series on tensor calculus, but if you really want me to make something, let me know in the comments and I'll see if I have time to cook something up. Anyway, that should do it for this video. Hopefully all of this made some sense to you, especially the Levi Savita part, since that can get a bit confusing. I'd like to thank the following patrons, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan signing out.